Welcome to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Hank Tanner, president of Automation and Electronics, a Wyoming-based engineering contractor building industrial-scale immersion mines. We hit all the questions immersion miners are asking, including build design, machine tips, and scaling immersion setups. Hank, thanks so much for both reaching out and joining us on the podcast to talk about immersion mining. It's different to find someone who's solely focused on immersion, and we get so many questions about immersion, whether it be emails, on Twitter, on Telegram. People really want to do immersion setups, but there's such a perceived barrier to entry, uh, and I think this conversation is really going to help out a lot of miners. So thanks again for joining us. Sure, yeah. Yeah, let's just start off with yourself and your own Bitcoin journey and how you got into mining and then maybe into immersion as well. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Hank Tanner. I'm president at a company, Automation Electronics. We're based out of Casper, Wyoming. And, you know, our company has been around since the 1950s, but we got into Bitcoin mining uh, late 2019. A friend of mine that uh, has his own Bitcoin mining company called me and said, we bought this enclosure. We want to know how it compares and will it pass electrical code? And so we went over um, and looked at it. There were some pretty bad issues. And so at that point, we started working on buildings with him and started building buildings uh, for air cooled units all the way from, you know, 250, 350 kilowatts to, to one megawatt boxes, um, focusing on making sure that they would pass uh, electrical checks in the NEC. Um, and at that point we've, we've since built a few large facilities, all air cooled. We have one here in Wyoming that we built with a, a partner of ours that right now has nine megawatts online. Um, and then there are other projects scattered across the state. So, uh, that's, that's how we got into to Bitcoin and blockchain. About a year ago, we were having some conversations with, a few of my programmers and my job really here is to really come up with the bad ideas and then ask my groups how to make them better and fix them. And we decided, Hey, let's, let's start looking at this. Cause I think this may be the future. And I think that it really takes some expertise, engineering, programming and construction uh, in terms of a difference between air cooled and, and immersion. And Ultimately, the cost may not be a whole lot different, but it's 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 a whole new ball game in terms of what you need to be prepared for in terms of a process. Yeah, definitely. A lot of our miners are, or all of Compass miners are actually air cooled, and we have a lot of questions about immersion. It's something we want to go towards, just because obviously it's a little a little bit more profitable, if I can use that word. It's SEC doesn't come knocking on our door, but uh, it definitely does up the hash rate that you can manage. This is definitely a lot of benefits, but the perceived risks and barriers are there as well. And so we'll just tackle through a bunch of those uh, questions today. Let's start off with like the, the the basics if we can, like the why immersion, what caught your eye after building all these air-cooled facilities? Why did you want to go into immersion mining? So the main reason, well, there's a few main reasons. One, we just thought that it was a pretty exciting frontier in terms of being able to overclock them if you want to do that. Um, the other, the other part was that I, th I thought A&E was primed to be able to, to support this. You know, we have over 10,000 fabricated facilities across the country in the oil and gas space. So we know how to build these things that, to be rugged and then be self-supportive. Um, the last piece was there's always a certain amount of failure in air-cooled units, and, and it's more than you think. And so we see these miners coming back specifically industrial situations that are having dust and contaminants blown across them and causing issues with the miners. So we wanted to investigate at the time we didn't have any idea whether it was going to be better or not. Um, but we wanted to investigate that as a more, well, a, a relatively better environment for the miners and making them longer lasting. Totally. Like the profitability, I think, is the thing that catches people off guard. Like the fact that you can overclock machines with immersion setups is definitely interesting. So let's go into the first steps, like resources for getting this going. What, when we can even like have a theoretical here where maybe it's like a, a one megawatt mine, because I think 
a lot of times people might try to be doing this in their garage, but uh, for the most part, this conversation will try to make it like more on an, an industrial scale or a commercial scale. Uh, what would a one megawatt farm, immersion farm need to get started? What are some of the basic things that you would say, like hit this checklist uh, from, from a very basic standpoint? Yeah, you're going to, you're obviously going to need the power. So figure out where you're getting that. Um, let's just assume that you have that because you're going to do it, whether you're air cooling or, or liquid cooling. Um, at that point, you're, you're going to have to have either some connections from a mechanical standpoint and an electrical standpoint or know what you're doing on your own because, you know, if you have one megawatt worth of miners in immersion, it's probably somewhere just south of 200 units. It all depends on what miners you're running. But, you know, if the goal is overclocking, you may get somewhere north of 175, south of 200 miners. And so you have to you know, design a system basically that, that all these units can be in a bath um, and circulate that system to whatever cooling cooling method you have. So I think a lot of people use air coolers, um, but at that point, it doesn't really matter. That's because that's the easiest to have. You don't have to have water um, around. You know, I think that there's probably some facilities, especially industrial plants, that if they have cooling water loops and if they have cogeneration, it's just a win-win because they plug this thing in, they have the power for it, and then they just tap off their cooling water loop and have a heat exchanger and, and go. But the big thing is obviously the power and and the space. But the, I think the hardest thing is making sure that you have the um, expertise because you know it's it's a lot more. Once it gets going, it's not difficult, but it's a lot. There's a lot that goes into the design rather than just plugging power in and, and turn it on with air. Totally. So on the design front. Obviously, water cooled or immersion tech with computers has been around for a very long time. Like that is not new at all. But immersion in Bitcoin mining has definitely been a newer thing. Um, it's been it's been around. Like uh, Bitmain has made like the S nine. There was a hydro version of that, and obviously this year we've seen some S nineteen variants come out. But for the most part, it seems like it's very proprietary. Everyone has their own design, working slightly differently. When you're designing your systems or you've seen other people design their systems, what are the basic things that they're taking into account to make these immersion setups work? So on the, on the base situation, you just need a, a way to, to flow the liquid through the miners and circulate it then through a, a heat exchanger of some kind. Um, so it gets a little com more complicated when you want to create some efficiencies. You know, you can just overpower something and, and cool liquid off and, and go. But you're gonna, you know, have to overbuild your your process quite a bit. You know, where we have some novel ideas and and what we do in our control system. So, from an overview, you know, our, our one megawatt facility, for instance, temperature is key. So we have temperature monitors everywhere. Um, we have pressure. We have flow meters. The pump is on a VFD. The the coolers are on VFD. So you have all these control loops. Um, but but the real critical thing that that we found to make things efficient, and that's kind of what we've learned through our pilot plant, is you learn how to monitor each individual miner, and then you can use that hottest miner as your control point and keep things cool. Um, some other things that we do that I don't know that everybody does, you know, we we build our own PDUs, and we have the ability to start and stop individual miners and, and monitor loads, monitor, monitor harmonics which allows us to load shed. It allows us to start up slowly if you're on generator. So we can control not only overclocking, but we can control how many miners are running too, if, if something needs to happen to, to cool off there. So it's, it's not specifically hard to get a, a system going, um, but to make it efficient is, is kind of the tricky part that you need to have some, some real good personnel that know what they're doing. Yeah, it seems to be the same with air cool, just to a different extent. With air cool, you also need to have people who understand how heat flows work. But here with immersions, obviously, like the next step up. That's interesting. You brought up that you use like the hottest miner as like the the base level for your system. What are some other things that uh, immersion miners should be cognizant of when they're building out these systems? I've seen that some people leave the fans on. I've seen some people take the fans off. I've seen some people like like you said. Leave, build their own PDUs. Some people move them out of the system completely. Some people put them into the system. 
Uh, how do you generally dip your ASICs? Our goal is, you know, as, as, as hard as I've made it sound, our goal is to make it as easy as possible for the actual farm itself. So the only thing that we do is take the fans off. Um, we've played around with taking the, the power supplies off. But from our point of view anyways, if you're going to that length, we need to start working on, you know, let's just get density of chips up and take the entire miner apart and just start putting chips in bass. So we're not there yet with anybody. The The need hasn't really gotten there. So all we do is take the fans off and then, and then submerge the whole unit uh, at that point to make it easier for, you know, issues or if there's, if there's something that needs to be done to the miner or replace the miner, things like that. So when you're, is it similar to an air cooled setup where you're trying to basically separate the, the hot side and the cool side as much as possible? Um, I'm assuming that's a yes. And like what sort of systems or designs do you do to, to implement that? Yeah. So, so we, you're right. Yeah. You want to, you want to basically, um, we don't, we basically flow liquid through the miners and then once it goes through the miners, it's, it's taken out to the coolers after that point. And so we do believe that there is a benefit to, to overflowing the liquid. So, um, although we can slow down the flow rate and slow down the fans, we do, we do cool it uh, a little more than necessary just because we think that's better. Um, you know, in terms of a hot and a cool side, it's, it's different for immersion because you don't necessarily need a large hot side anymore. You just need a way to take it away. So when it flows up out of the tank, you know, if you're, if you're flowing in the bottom of a tank or flowing in the, you know, the horizontal at the lower end of the miners, you know, um, fluid mechanics is going to take it to the other side of the tank. So it's going to flow up through the top of the miner and then go to the suction in your pump, basically. Um, there's a few ways you can do that, but I mean, it's all relatively the same uh, for, for those that are out there in the industry. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. For the immersion liquid itself, and it's funny, we get so specific questions from some of the miners out there, probably because they, they're they trying to do this themselves and hit a bottleneck. Uh, but how often are you having to recycle fluid? Can you recycle fluid? Do you purchase new fluid? And maybe even for like, a one megawatt mine or something like that. How many gallons of fluid do you have to use? The last, the last question you ask is going to be pretty dependent on your piping. Um, I'll give you just a, a rough example. Um, so I don't think it'll use this much, but our one megawatt facility, we always buy about 25 barrels, which is 55 times 25 or you know, there's like 3.7 liters. They, they, they price all their things on liters and then sell it in gallons. So, um, <laughs> it's like, 50, it's like 25 barrels, uh, for, for a megawatt system. But you got to remember if your coolers are farther away, you're going to have more piping. you you know, it's, it's, it all matters on your, your total facility design. Um, remind me what the rest of your questions were. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious to know how often you, flip in new coolant, oh, uh, right. new fluid, or can you even recycle it? Cause my understanding is it does get pretty expensive when you're using this stuff. I've also heard yes. it has a long shelf life. So it's, it's expensive. Um, the good news is, is our expectation is it's going to last as long as the miners, but we do uh, intend to do conductivity checks and make sure that we're seeing no degradation. Um, I, I can't answer that because we haven't been running for five years, 10 years. I can tell you that we haven't uh, had to change out any fluid yet. Um, our expectation is that there's going to be some cleaning that's necessary and, and those things are going to have to happen in terms of preventative maintenance. But um, we, we haven't seen a requirement to, to change the fluid yet. And we've tested multiple fluids. So uh, we're trying to see what's out there and make sure that they're all on the same playing field and, and go from there. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see everyone's different perspective on these things. Cause and maybe you can kind of clarify for myself, uh, the difference between oil based immersion. And then we also have these people who are doing water based immersion, obviously like the bitmains of the world are rolling out like this new ant miner, uh, that's based only using water to my knowledge, but then we have immersion units that are using this mineral oil. What are the differences between those two things? And why do these different miners have to use different types of liquid? So 
you know, we haven't we haven't di- dove into the water cooled systems yet. I mean, I can I can answer this from a what I, I I wouldn't take this without doing a little research. But you know, my my assumption is that obviously with uh, your your um, water systems, the water is not going to be in direct contact with the with the electronics unless they're going straight distilled water. Maybe it's a sealed system. Um, I will tell you that that the facilities we're building are intended to be swappable. So, you know, if you build five megawatts and this equipment comes out that's water cooled and we can do that, the idea is that we'll be able to plug that into to one megawatt, if that makes sense. So um, we have not investigated that a whole lot. You know, the idea with the dielectric fluid um, being non-conductive is that it can, it can go everywhere and carry out the heat. And so, that that's that's the whole idea behind that. You don't necessarily have to worry about where it's going. It's a little more shotgun approach than than probably the water, unless, like I said, I, I haven't done quite enough research on the water or any at all. To be honest, we know it's coming, but but we haven't seen the buy-in on that quite yet. Yeah, it's always funny having conversations with different miners out there, and they're they hear about immersion mining for the first time, and they hear about like water cooled machines and like electronics and water like that doesn't go together, but in Bitcoin mining, anything is possible, apparently. Uh, we'll keep going down the list, actually. We're, we're kind of going through like the life cycle of a miner here, life cycle of an immersion setup. Uh, interested in the lifespan and upkeep on these machines. And you said something earlier that I've heard from a lot of people that it's pretty simple once you have it up and running. The machine just keeps chugging along, hashing, as long as your pumps are clear, as long as the fluid is running through them correctly and you have good temperature probes and everything don't have to touch it as much from your experience with air cooled units versus immersion. What would you say is easier to keep uh, running over the long term, and what needs more maintenance? From a maintenance stance, I think that um, your air cooled facilities are going to be a little more uh, maintenance heavy. So you're going to have individual miners fail. The, the nice thing about air cooled is that it's clean. You know, you can go in and you can take a miner down. You can replace boards, power supply, whatever you want to do. Um, without making too much of a mess, you know, from an immersion stance, the idea is to, to set it and forget it as much as you possibly can. So once you take the fans off and submerge that miner, you really want to touch it as little as possible. Um, once you get in that oil, if you have to do something and then we've, we've made changes, we've, we've goofed around with power supplies. So we've taken things out of, out of solution. Uh, it's it's kind of messy. The good news is that the velocity on that liquid is so slow that your hope is that you know that that miner is basically sitting on a, on a shelf with like it would be forever if you took a miner and just set it on a shelf in your garage or something. So you know whether there's some degradation of anything in the miner and eventually you may have to do something. What we've seen is you touch it so little that. That is pretty rare that something breaks down. It's pretty. Uh, it's a good alpha right there. I'll say that. I think a lot of people have concerns about like maybe something being corrupted or, or something going wrong, and then not being able to fix it because it's in a liquid. Uh, one question I, w- I meant to ask earlier, but I'm gonna ask it now since it popped back in my brain. Which machine do you like using the most for these setups, or have you even used multiple different types of machines? Like, are you preferring ant miners and S19s when you're building these out? What's miners? Maybe something else. So it's funny you ask that. We're, we're, we're in the middle of looking at Watts Miner now that there's some potential firmware options out there. Um, just from my perspective on air cooled units, Watts Miners have been more durable than uh, Ant Miner. But we've, we've only been testing Ant Miners in our pilot plant, and that's what we intend to use in uh, our facilities. Um, and it, we have quite a few S17s, which get a pretty bad rap in the air cooled world, but they've, they've worked pretty darn well in the immersion world. I think that has a lot to do with all they do is sit there and work and there's not a whole lot of stress on them from the outside world. Um, but we also have all different kinds of S19. So we have S19s, S19Js, J pros, S19 pros, and we've been, we've been looking at all of them. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, the 
recently we were down in uh, Austin for Scott's Mining Conference and What's Miner had set up, or Micro BT rather, had set up an immersion setup that was pretty cool. It was like vertically stacked and it had uh, all the heat running from the bottom. And up. I don't think it even had a PSU on it, but it's cool to see that stuff in person. Uh, definitely kind of captures the imagination. Well, and I think the more and more that I, I don't know whether it's home miners or industrial miners that we see looking at immersion, I think there was a lot of kickback to start. And now they're seeing that there's a market there. And that rather than fight it, they're all starting to try and make some money doing it. So I yeah. think that they're all going to start coming out with solutions and hopefully they're good ones. And, and you know, they, they may potentially be even better. You know, I, I would guess that they've been thinking about this longer than any of us have. So, you know, they may come out with something that they've had and make it really economical for, for everybody to do. Yeah, just to go on the side road here for a second, I do think that there's been a lot more professionalization in the ASIC market. I think there's a lot more maturity. Big players like Intel moving in, for instance, is definitely going to shake up uh, the incumbents in the room like MicroBT and like Bitmain. I think they've had a lot of stuff under the, the pillow covers that they're going to pull out and say like, hey, look at this. We can we can do this with our ASICs. Uh, I think that the new Ant space uh, is, is one good indication of that. They're new. Hydro Plus machine, which can do like 198 terahash, so pretty powerful machine. Uh, I, I'm curious about the lifespan and what you think about the secondary market for ASICs that have been dipped. From my understanding and from talking from mostly like retail immersion miners, people are trying to do this at home and like fish tanks and whatnot. When they put it in, they're basically giving it up and saying it's going to live there forever. They're not going to pull it out, clean it up, and resell it. When I've talked to some industrial immersion miners like the folks down at Winestone basically has been the same thing. They have the intention to keep that miner in the immersion unit for the rest of its life. And if they do plan on selling it, the buyer has to understand that the machine needs to stand, stay in that uh, condition it's in. What's been your take on the secondary market for these machines? I, I think that that's probably the smartest way to think of it. You know, there, there's, you can take it out and our concerns are that you know, if there is any degradation and you try and run it in air or something like that, uh, what's going to happen? I would expect that at, at a minimum, you need to expect to you're going to sell it to someone that's going to put it in immersion. Yeah, totally. I think we've seen... I, I wonder what's going to happen with a lot of these other machines, the older ones. I, I don't think most people are going to spend time with S9s into immersion units. But like you said, I've heard a lot of T17 series being put in immersion just because... They had a lot of problems with the heat sinks, is my understanding, and it just made sense. Like they're still powerful machines, and they can still uh, have some lifespan afterwards. Uh, what? Let's get into some specifics, if I can. Uh, submerging the power units and anything of that nature. What has been the most difficult to work around? Or do you have any tips for people who are thinking about taking off the PSUs or leaving parts on? Uh, maybe. Some, some obstacles you found out when you're taking off the fans and submerging the units? Yeah, I would recommend on, I mean, I would recommend taking, taking only the fans off and then um, keeping the power supply on. We only did that a couple times before we decided that, you know, there's just not enough benefit to taking that off. Um, at least that we've seen so far. So I, I don't know that, there's any benefit from my point of view to taking the power supply off, you know, and I keep harping back on this point. The one thing that I would make sure that people are doing properly is make sure that the power feeding your miners is, is done correctly. You know, this is, it's not rocket science, but it needs to be correct. So, you know, when you're setting up your 240 or whatever you're doing, uh, make sure that that, make sure that that's right. Um, one thing that we've done you know, they have an SD card extender that makes it kind of nice. We bring that from the bottom of the miner up so that that part is out. So that if you need to do anything to the firmware, uh, you don't have to goof around with getting your hands submerged and taking that card out. Yeah. Is it hard to do maintenance on machines? Once it's immersed, you basically just have to unplug it, pull it out and then wait for it to dry off before you do any yes, maintenance. It's, it's hard. So you want to yeah. put all the planning. It's not hard. It's messy. So you want to put as much thought into how you're going to do that and try and eliminate as much work as possible that you think you can. So 
I can't think of too much work that has to happen on the actual miner itself. Um, that's the good, that's the good news. But if you have to take out a miner, leave some space in whatever tank you're using so that maybe you can set it over it and let it drain down and work from there. Um, but I don't want to pretend like it doesn't suck to try and have to do something to a miner that's been sitting in liquid. Yeah, but it's pretty greasy and, and pretty messy. So maybe have some like rubber gloves on hand, I'd suppose. Uh, one other question that you just popped up is firmware. I think a lot of people have, that, that's going to be a question for the next two years. Like what kind of firmware should we use? We just had a podcast with Foreman on remote hosting software. And that's a little bit separate than firmware, but it definitely talks to firmware and makes a miner's life a little bit easier when you do have that set up. From the firmware perspective, what are you guys using and what are some settings that you prefer for your miner? So we're we're testing multiple firmwares. We haven't really nailed down one that we're going to lean on yet. I will tell you that the way that we designed our power structure, um, we basically right now are running at 90% capacity, hoping and thinking, planning that firma will come available that will... Uh, be more electricity friendly while also getting the terahash hash up. So I guess long way to get to the answer I was trying to get to is be careful with your, with your firmware because more terahash hash doesn't necessarily mean better for you. You know, we, we've gotten things up to 160, 170 terahash hash that make no economical sense. It was cool to see on the screen, but we would never run it there. Um, and as a matter of fact, you know, our sweet spot right now is 130 terahash and we can get to 135 easy, but the firmware is not there and it costs more, you know, watts per terahash at that point. So my, my one piece of guidance would be, and this is kind of something that we've done that, that we share with the people we're working with is all the homework that we put in on tracking different settings to find the sweet spot in terms of how much, you know, making more money. So don't, if you, if you have the tools to be able to look at your equipment and see how many amps it's drawing, how many Watts it's drawing, don't automatically assume that the higher Terra hash is going to be your best place to go. Yeah. Let's dive into that question a little bit more if we can and, and maybe clarify it. So were you reaching a point where, the extra terra hash value you're getting was was just not worth it because the wattage to pull from the machines was so much greater. Like overclocking just became expensive because these machines were requiring so much energy. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you yeah. know, we've seen some that, you know, you you get up to 140 terra hash and you're using this is just numbers for numbers sake, but you're using five thousand watts. And when you're at 135 or something and you're using 4,100 watts, that electrical savings um, can be more economical than trying to get that extra terahash output. That's super interesting. I didn't know that it quite scaled that way. Uh, I think that's a good point for for everyone to know. Uh, I want to move the conversation away from the specifics and move into more general. When you're scaling an immersion setup, what are the considerations that you have to take into account? It seems like this would be much more logistically intensive on the front end, and then on the back end, it's a lot easier. So when we're thinking about an air-cooled setup, which you can definitely give us some good information on as well. You more or less just need to get the machines on the rack. You need to have a good, maybe a hash header, a retrofitted facility, make sure that the hot and cool aisles are built correctly, get their firmware set up. And then you more or less, you have to have someone on staff there, maybe a few people on rotation to unplug new plug-in machines, make sure like fans are all clean or dust, all that stuff is happening. With immersion, it seems to be like you probably have to have a pretty large staff to get this going at first with a very knowledgeable staff, lots of um, you know, social capital, so to speak. And then from there, like, do you even need someone to babysit the machines or can you just run remote software and call it a day and, and kick back from wherever you're living? Yeah, so I think you're right. And and one, if, if anybody is thinking about getting into large scale immersion projects, um, having good partners that you're working with that that realize that, that you know there's obviously risk with anything, but there's also going to be commissioning headaches within like with any other project. So um, 
you're right. It, there, there are two things. Let's start with what you started with, talked about first. Um, so we, we build one megawatt containers that are in shipping containers um, that go down the road. There are people that make two megawatt shipping containers that go down the road. Uh, you can't do that with immersion. Well, let me not, let me rephrase that. We haven't been smart enough yet to figure out how to put a megawatt worth of immersion miners into an eight by eight container, eight by 40 container and still meet the national electric code. So there may be, I've seen some things out there that look really cool. So I'm not the smartest person in the world. We, our container is, is, you know, more along the lines of how many can we fit into a truck that we can drive down the road um, and use our history of building skidded electrical packages and skidded process packages and turn that into a, a really good product. So we're our building. That's how we designed it. We said, how big can we realistically drive something down the road? And then how many can we fit in to that facility? And we went through probably, well, we went through months of, of layout design before we settled on, on what we're doing. Um, trying to maximize the space while our, while also meeting, you know, any codes that we need to meet. I love that line. We, you guys fit as many as you could on the road as possible to get it there. That's sick. Uh, in terms of like the electrical requirements, I've been hearing a lot of rumors more and more that regulators, in the United States on like the local county level, and then also the state level are getting more and more interested in checking out Bitcoin mines uh, to seeing if they're up to spec when you're, building these immersion facilities, how much guidance is out there on what you guys can and cannot build and how, how often are these things being checked uh, off? I don't know if you have any insight to other immersion builds that you guys don't work on. Um, so I don't, um, but I can tell you this, you know, like I said, you know, our, our main business is not in this industry. So our main business is construction and we're used to dealing with inspectors and getting permits. And so we've tried to be as transparent with the counties that we're working with from the get go. Um, you know, our, our electrical permit for a site on grid is 60, 70, a hundred pages long. And so we, we start doing arc flash studies and I think that it's an, important to communicate with your inspectors as early as possible because you know, from my experience, if you don't and they come in late and they feel like you, you know, weren't trying to be helpful, it's going to be harder on you in the end. I don't know if that helps with your question or not, but that, that's what we do from, from our stance. Yeah, no worries. Every time I ask that question on the podcast, people give me very general answers because I think it is fair. Like there's no one set answer. Oftentimes you're, you're dealing with a regulator on a local level that has their own feeling about it. Uh, I, I know for Compass's standpoint, we had some facilities down in Oklahoma and in one county, things were like rocking and rolling. We're all set on permits. And then one county over, uh, for some reason, they, did, they literally didn't like that one part was 12 inches too close to another part. And so they said like, hey, you need to fix this. So it just really depends on both the regulator in the area and then uh, your, your specific build out. Uh, so your answer is probably more or less what I expected. Well, I, your comment is funny because it's frustrating. Inches matter to the electrical code. And you go, why does it matter that this is 48 inches face to face on these two control panels? And to me and you, it doesn't matter. But, you know, there's some some history there that says when they're this far apart, there's less chance of someone getting hurt than if they're, you know, 46 inches apart. And we go, that's two inches. But yeah. yeah. It matters. <laughs> There's always a story behind everything, but you know you yeah. can't can't really ask it at that point. Uh, <laughs> we're rounding out the conversation, I'm going to ask you something that is very unfair, but I'm curious: what percentage of Bitcoin mining is going to be immersion based? Do you think in five years from now? Uh, obviously, it's taking off, and your firm has a huge interest in building these industrial sites. Uh, I I don't know if you have any inkling, maybe just about Wyoming or the United States. But where do you think immersion is going from here? So from my personal stance, I think there's going to be a space for both air cooled and immersion. Um, you know, from our stance, immersion is going to need a little more of a, um, 
background in processes and process control and monitoring. So I think you're going to see a lot of businesses that already have that capability. And when I say that, I think, you know, existing plants, um, immersion plugs right into because they have people there around the clock. They have people that know how to do this type of thing. And generally they have power. So if they can get buy-in on, on their investor side, you, you're going to see immersion start sprouting up. The big money players that have lots and lots of money, immersion is going to take off there too. Um, for the same reason, because not necessarily that they have the things in place, but they can afford to put the things in place. Um, air cooled, I think, is always going to have its place too, because you know it, it's it's just easier to start it, walk away when there's a problem, you come and fix it. It's not incredibly difficult to fix. Um, you have more problems, I think, but but it's it's easier and it's got a cheaper you know front end cost. Um, the one thing we didn't really talk about that that I think is important is you know the extra cost. I don't believe is necessarily in the equipment. You know, miners are so expensive that if you can overclock, you can kind of capture your extra material and equipment costs with the number of miners you have to buy. The real cost is going to be building the infrastructure to support that immersion system, um, just to make sure that it's running properly all the time. Yeah, maybe if you have a, a number like a cost per megawatt, I'd be interested to know that because that definitely is something we didn't hit on in the conversation and obviously it changes by setup. Yeah. So we'll I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this right now, you know, if, if you're, if you're overclocking and planning to overclock to numbers that we see, the cost for immersion isn't more than, than air cooled. It's not less either. They're, they're pretty comparable. Um, you get to buy such a, a, well, let me say that you buy such fewer machines that you can afford to pay for a little more infrastructure in the terms of your immersion equipment. And then machines have a uh, longer life and it's easier upkeep and some other benefits. Agreed. That's, that's our whole point of view. Like, um, you know, there's obviously you're, you're going to lose power to just industry as the years go by. But if you can run a hundred machines and potentially lose one or two a year versus whatever you're losing on air cool, and you can run them for four years, five years, run them until it's economical not to, you know, that that's the real goal. We want to run these miners until the economics tell us we need to replace them, not until they break. Awesome. I think that's a great place to leave the conversation. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast. Yeah, thank you so much.